This is Scott Mann, and you are listening to the Permaculture Podcast, a listener-supported program. If you enjoy this or any other episode in the archives, become a member by signing up at patreon.com slash permaculturepodcast. My guest for this episode is John Wages, the new editor of Permaculture Design Magazine. With issue number 96, the long-running American permaculture digest, Permaculture Activist, became Permaculture Design, and with that, John Wages took over the role as the publisher and editor from Peter Bain. During the conversation today, John shares with us how he became involved with the magazine, why the name change, what we can expect in the near future, and his long-term plans, including improved digital content, moving to a full-color format, the desire for a more frequent publication schedule, and even the possibility of additional magazines to cater to different permaculture audiences. Now then, on to John Wages. I'll join you afterwards with his contact information and other updates. Can you share with us, John, how you came to become the editor of what is now Permaculture Design Magazine, previously Permaculture Activist, how you got involved with that and came to permaculture, and then we can take the conversation from there. Uh, sure. Well, that's, that's a really long story. I guess it, it began with some awareness as I was growing up. I, I grew up in north, northeast Mississippi in the country uh, on a small farm, 25-acre farm, not a working farm. Uh, my, my father rented this farm to, to a neighbor who grew row crops, uh, pretty typical stuff. But still, it was a, a nice rural setting, and yet near a, a fairly progressive, you know, uh, uh, growing small town. And so I had, a, I had an opportunity to do a lot of reading and and. I read books by Helen and Scott Nearing, and I read Ruth Stout. I remember reading Ruth Stout's No Work Garden book back in the 70s, and I developed an interest in, in organic gardening back when I was in high school, I guess, maybe even before that. I remember subscribing to the old organic uh, gardening magazine. I wouldn't have to use the, the previous name. And so I, I did a lot of gardening. I learned a lot from my grandmother, actually. And I, I saw a lot of problems the way things were grown and, and sort, of, sort of the need for a different system sort of beyond organic system was kind of there uh, from a very early age. And to be honest with you, I'm not quite sure where I first came across the word permaculture. Uh, I don't think it was part of my awareness in an explicit sense back then. I do know that in 2004, uh, I, knew, I knew a little bit about permaculture. I ran across an ad that Peter Bain had placed for an associate edit- editor position with the activist. And uh, I was interested in doing some writing. I've always done a lot of writing on the on the side, some political, some gardening, this and that. And so I answered that ad, and Peter and I began to discuss things, and we decided I would guest at an issue, kind of, you know, see how that worked out. And that was the, the education issue. I don't recall the, the issue number, but it was back in 2004. It got a great reception. Uh, I got a chance to explore a lot of really interesting themes in there, like homeschooling, unschooling, free schools. We had an article about the Albany Free School. Uh, we had an article in there about the work Charlie Heddington has been doing in North Carolina. We had something there that's uh, sort of akin to online learning, what Will Hooker did with, with public television in, in North Carolina. Just a whole whole plethora of really exciting and very interesting articles. And I myself contributed a small, very small piece of the article lineup, the article on folk schools, which Peter had suggested, you know, adding to flesh out the issue, kind of complete the picture. As part of that, I, I came across something called the Highlander School, which growing up in the South and you know, fancying myself to be fairly progressive, I had never actually heard of the Highlander School. And so, of course, that's that's a school where Martin Luther King and certain other people who were active in the civil rights movement went to learn nonviolent techniques of resistance and uh, how to affect progressive change. So it's a very important part of American history, which I totally missed. So I, I really enjoyed editing that issue a lot and interacted a lot with Peter. Learned a lot about writing and editing from Peter just as a result of that. He, uh, of course, teaches permaculture design courses, and the natural next step, if I wanted to, to do this more, was to take one of those courses. And so I signed up for um, PDC at Earth Haven, which was taught by Peter and Chuck Marsh in 2005 in the summer. It was taught in two sections, the, the first half that summer and the second half of the, the following summer. So my wife Gwen joined me for the first half, went up to Earth Haven, and it was your typical, you know, it's not a cliche to say that it was a life-changing experience. It really was, because we, we got a chance to step out of our daily routine and have, have some time to, to meditate and think about the state of the world and, of course, what to do about that. And permaculture offers a lot of solutions, obviously, as all the listeners here know, not just to growing food, but also to, to living and, and designing a better world, building the world we really want. 
So permaculture has a, an holistic view of things, how things relate to one another. And so this was exactly what I've been looking for. And it really resonated with me, and I think it was Glenn as well. And I did the second half the next summer with Peter and uh, Keith Johnson and Rhonda Baird in Indiana. Uh, Glenn, I wasn't able to join me for that, unfortunately, but um, I did complete the, the PDC in 2006. So where was I? I talked about how I became editor. So after the education issue, I guess I did several other issues. Uh, the animals issue, animals in permaculture, that was, a, I think, a pretty successful issue. We had, I remember, a nice article there on llamas and alpacas, a lot of great pictures. And then I did a, a 20th anniversary issue, which allowed me to speak with a lot of people who've been involved in the permaculture movement since the, the early 80s when he first came to North America. Sego Jackson wrote a nice article there for us, and people contributed pictures from the very early convergences in Washington State, where Bill Mollison and uh, Masanova Fukuoka and Wes Jackson were there. If you've seen that issue, you know the picture I'm talking about <laughs> pretty fantastic picture and a fantastic issue, not not anything that I did really, and the success of the activist is not really due to, due to me. Uh, I would say Peter put an awful lot into it, but it's due to our, our writers, people who contributed over the years. So I mentioned Sego Jackson. Sego Jackson and Guy Baldwin had started the activist uh, initially as a newsletter, I think, for Permaculture Institute of North America uh, back in the 80s. And Peter took it over, I think, sometime in the early 90s and morphed it into uh, what we have today, called it the activist, and started the new system of numbering the issues and the color, eventually a color cover and all this sort of sort of thing, and made it look like a, more than just a newsletter, but an actual quarterly magazine. And he built it, I uh, built it up tremendously over the years, and you know, I'm really honored that he offered me this opportunity to take over the responsibility for it, and hopefully to take it to the next level. It's always interesting for me to hear the stories of how people came to permaculture, though usually it's coming to permaculture in having some kind of a direct interest in it and then connecting with the community as opposed to you were working as the as a guest editor for permaculture activist before you were really steeped in this material. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And with your work then in writing on the side, what kind of a professional background did you come from before uh, getting involved with this? Were you a teacher or... Well, once again, not, not very not very typical and probably not the answer you're going to expect. My background is actually uh, uh, in the natural sciences. I have a master's degree in biology with a biochemistry specialization from Mississippi State and from Johns Hopkins. And I've worked in, in um, the life science industry and, and diagnostics companies, very small companies for the most part, over the years. But I've always had an interest in, in doing something more, more meaningful more, in terms of change positive change in the world. This is one opportunity among several. I also had an opportunity to teach community college several years in my hometown of Tupelo uh, in Mississippi. So um, a little little bit of historical background here. I grew up there, and Gwen and I moved away. We lived in California for about, well, roughly 10 years, and returned home to Mississippi in 2001, specifically to do some gardening and to try to effect some progressive change around there and to look after our, our respective families, which were getting a little bit older. And so uh, during that time, I, I taught community college. So that was really, I think, um, a useful thing. I sort of see it as sort of community service. Community college, you just don't get paid a whole lot, as everybody probably knows. And that was a very rewarding experience, I would say. A professional background in biology, working then as a teacher at a community college, writing and editing on the side, and then in 2000 four, five, and six, you discover permaculture and just kind of jump right in with your work with the activist. That's pretty much it, right. From there, there's now this transition from Peter Bain as the editor of the activist to you being the editor now. There was recently a Kickstarter campaign that raised in excess of $15,000 to help make this transition. And I know that I received the issue uh, that is now Permaculture Design Magazine, formerly the Permaculture Activist. Can you give me a bit of the background and story on why this name change. That's a question that I've received from a number of people when I said I was going to be sitting down to do this interview with you. Why the name change from permaculture activist to permaculture design? Well, at the North American Permaculture Convergence in Minnesota last summer, uh, Peter and I organized a short uh, media roundtable, most of which, I mean, we didn't really, well, we intended for the activists to hopefully, you know, get some feedback 
you know, and we, we were kind of, we were kind of announced the change at that point, but people were so so interested in discussing this that it pretty much took over the whole round table. And we got a lot of a lot of feedback, a lot of suggestions. Changing the name was one of those suggestions. And as I recall, permaculture design was one of the names people suggested. My recollection could be wrong on that. It might be that that came out of a of a post round table discussion that Peter and Rhonda Baird and I had. But at any rate, it resonated with us. And the reason we liked it is because one of the comments we'd received was that the, the term activist connotes a very specific type of reader who is extremely and deeply committed and involved in this permaculture system. And that's fine. We certainly do have a magazine that's targeted toward that particular readership. And we hope that we offer some articles that are of use to experienced designers. But we don't want to just... Uh, serve that community. We want to, to serve people who are coming into permaculture for the first time and who are just kind of on the periphery and kind of asking, what is this all about? Is it just a buzzword like sustainability? What does it really mean? How can I use it in my life? Is it relevant to the wider world? And, or is it just a fancy way of companion planning? What exactly is this? And so for that reason, we wanted to change the name and, and ha- have it not so narrowly focused. Now, does that make sense? We also thought about permaculture designer. We thought about permaculture life. But Peter, Rhonda, and I thought that Permaculture Design was a very good, all-encompassing uh, new title for it. One of the threads of conversation that I've been having is about how can we make permaculture more accessible and more mainstream. And I can understand the negative connotation that activists can have among some potential readers. Just as on the other side, moving the name to something like Permaculture Life would make it seem more like a lifestyle magazine. Exactly. As much as there's this thought of permaculture as both a design system and a movement and a way of living, if it becomes something like permaculture life, then does that put it kind of in the same category as many of those other lifestyle magazines where it's something that's just kind of, you know, fluff, a couple of tips here and there, but not a, a lot of depth that the activist has provided over the years? That's exactly what we thought, and yeah, that's the reason for the change. I might quickly add one thing that came out of the convergence was a suggestion for several other journals that we might eventually consider starting, including a peer-reviewed journal. This convergence came on the heels of our very very well-received issue on experimentation in science and permaculture. There's a lot of research ongoing, as listeners here probably know. The land, some of the land-grant institutions are starting to get interested in things like agroforestry uh, with a more permaculture slant and multiple plantings, that sort of thing. The work Kevin Waltz is doing at University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign is very exciting. It was featured in that issue. Also, somebody suggested having a professional journal that would more or less be like the, the activists, or, but perhaps even more explicitly focus on, on teachers and designers, and then a less technical journal, like Permaculture Design. And I think somebody even suggested having a children's journal of permaculture. So all those are very interesting ideas, and... You know, I like them all, frankly, and in many ways, I would like to just jump in and do them all, but that would be a huge mistake because I can tell you my hand's completely full of trying to manage just, just getting this, this next issue out and managing all the subscriptions, learning the systems Peter set up. It's a, it's a huge logistical, huge logistical task to master. But eventually, you know, we may, depending on the feedback we continue to get, we may try to do something along these lines with, with other journals or, or, um, Something like that. We'll have to see. Anybody listening here should feel free to give feedback. We really need a lot of a lot of input. If they're also interested in potentially becoming an editor of one of these other journals, should they also contact you and see about getting that rolling? Or is that something you'd rather hold off on and wait until you're a little bit further down the road? Oh, no, absolutely. It's, it's not too early to start thinking and planning. And certainly we um, do, uh, as, as everybody probably knows, we have guest editors for various issues of permaculture design. And in fact, Adam Brock is going to be guest editing the upcoming issue on decolonizing permaculture. And so certainly if anybody's interested in guest editing the uh, permaculture design magazine or discussing, you know, getting one of these other efforts started or just whatever you might be interested in contributing, just writing an article, we'd certainly love to hear from you. And I will make sure to include information in the show notes where people can get in touch with you. Yeah, that's great. So with this transition, are you still teaching and working as well as running permaculture design? Or are you shifting your focus more and more to the production of that magazine? Well, the long, I'm not teaching anymore, but the long-range plan is to shift my focus completely to this. Gwen and I moved back to Northern California uh, in 2011. 
and our plan is for, to eventually get back to Mississippi where our farm is. Uh, we have a house there that we reclaimed, and, and we want to retrofit that house, and we have a lot of plans for that property. And as we mentioned during the Kickstarter, uh, my plan is eventually to return there. The, t- the horizon for that change, I, I, I'm not completely sure, but it's probably two to three, maybe four years down the road. As part of that Kickstarter that we've both mentioned, there were a lot of plans about being able to get the archives digitized and online, a new website. What are the plans uh, now as you take over and with the success of that Kickstarter for people who didn't see that project or aren't familiar with what's happening um, with this transition? Where are you going to be taking the magazine, the material over the next few years? Yeah, let me just first thank everybody who contributed to the Kickstarter. Uh, we've had a few people who hadn't known about it, and they've contributed a little bit uh, after the fact. We raised 16000 almost 16000 out of that effort. So what we're working on first is uh, the new website. And, of course, uh, as everybody probably knows, if you've gone to permaculturedesignmagazine.com, you've seen that it still is an app. So it's, it's almost there. In fact, by the time this podcast airs, it will almost certainly be up and running. And uh, initially, it will be very much like the old activist site with much of the same content. We have a directory of the Permaculture Institutes in North America and throughout the world that Keith Johnson has ported over to the new website. So all that content, all those resources will still be there. Our store will still be there where you can purchase books and DVDs. And, of course, you can order subscriptions, you can order back issues of Permaculture Design, or our Agroforestry News. We'll continue to distribute Agroforestry News, of course. So I think, you know, very soon that website will be up and running. And the, the, the prototype that I've seen works very well. The store functions all work. It's a little bit smoother to use than the, the old website. And we'll be making a lot of changes going forward to this. Renovating the website has been much, much more work than I thought. I'm not really a web person, and so obviously I, we have someone who has volunteered and we 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 have somebody we're paying a professional web designer to work on this and to do it right but uh, certainly and it's going to look very nice but certainly we have a lot of plans for it we want to change it and once it's up and running i welcome any kind of feedback anybody has however you think we could interface some of the nice permaculture blogs with our website uh anything like that just shoot me uh, an email and let me know what you think our time in the back issues is just kind of getting started. Again, that's a huge, huge endeavor. Our goal here is to archive issues 1 through 90 because they're the ones that, that I've indexed already. Peter and I worked on indexing projects over the last few years, and as people probably know, we ran those indices in the form of a general index and a species index. So we already have all that done for the first 90 issues. We're currently on issue 96, by the way. So our goal is to produce 1 through 90 in PDF form, and to provide that on a CD or a DVD, that would be searchable. The problem is that the very early issues are only available in hard copy. And, of course, we can scan those and have OCR deliver a, a searchable document, which is easy to do. You know, I can do that. I have the equipment to do that. And it just takes a lot of, little bit of time there to do that and to get a, a, a high-quality product, high-quality scan as we can get. And the second, that, that's issues one through, I think, about... 40 or 41, then from issue 42 on to about 70 or something. But here's where we're not able to use some help from our listeners here. Those issues are actually in a page maker format, which I thought InDesign could open, but it turns out the InDesign Credit Cloud cannot open. And so we're in the need of somebody who can open those files and save them as PDFs. And that would be an enormous help if somebody could do that. I think if you just had an old, if you just had the page maker, Probably, I don't know, PageMaker 6, you can probably do that. At any rate, beyond issue 76, all those are easy. We already have PDFs of all those. So, you know, that's where we stand on that project. And um, I think we're looking at a minimum of three more months to, to get that done. And as you, as people who were involved with Kickstarter and the, up, the updates, as you know, we projected to next summer, I think, is when that would be deliverable. So we have a lot of time. I hope it won't take that long, but... It's going to be pretty slow if it's just me. So, again, if we have volunteers that can kick in and do part of this, that would be really wonderful. Uh, additionally, we want to go to a color format. I think that's presentation-wise. That has nothing really to do with content. But um, 
I think it will present much better and enable us to reach a, a wider audience. In some of the, the stores in Northern California here, I've seen Permaculture UK on the shelf. And, of course, that is a color format. It presents very nicely, you know, next to Sunset, for example. Permaculture Design has a lot of wonderful content, and that, that can stand on its own, but the casual observer may look at it and kind of dismiss it because it is a color. So we're looking for a way we can... First of all, increase the, the paper quality a little bit while maintaining the, the recycled content. And secondly, go to color without increasing the subscription cost. That's what I want to make sure that we, that we can do. So I'm in early discussions with the, the printer on how to, how to accomplish that. And we don't have an answer yet. We're not going to go to color anytime soon. I'm sure it's at least a year down the road. But, and again, I would like some feedback. So at the convergence, some people said they love it just the way it is. <laughs> they were very explicit about that. Other people said color would be nice. So I'd like to hear what more people more people have to say. And then going forward, you know, we can think about things like, you know, a monthly publication. I mean, if you really love Permacost Design and the information we're putting out there, you know, it's a long time between issues. And <laughs> it would be nice to have a monthly publication. This is, I think, way down the road. Uh, we're starting small and slow and counting the cost. We want to get started, but we also want to count the cost of this and make sure that um, what we're doing is sustainable and we continue it grow it slowly. I can imagine what a color magazine would look like, especially if it had like a square binding like many of the other magazines. So if you had it sitting on your shelf, you could see the spine or that display in a bookstore next to like the Permaculture UK magazine and being able to attract more uh, readership that way. But, but we don't want to increase subscription costs. Then we deliver a very good value. A subscription for issues is only $25. That's quite a good value. And I'm not sure that we can go to color or make the other changes you're, you're talking about without increased subscription costs. And we sure don't want to do that anytime soon. Yeah, I've seen some magazines now are seven fifty, eight fifty, nine fifty an issue. And that can even with subscription discounts, that can still be a little Yeah, we, we don't want we don't want to go there. That's too much. With all of these directions, where do you see permaculture design and these other plans that you have in, say, five or ten years? What are your long-term goals once these initial Kickstarter projects are completed? Well, among other things, we'd like to increase our, our subscribership and our readership by a lot. I think there is um, an enormous opportunity there to um, get a message out and to, to also teach useful skills. Our subscribership is much less, I would say. I'll just say much less than Permaculture UK. And why that should be is sort of a mystery to me because I'm sure there are more potential readers in North America. We consider our primary audience to be the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. And we have so many fewer subscribers. Why, why exactly is this? Is it a matter of people not knowing that this publication exists? And I really think that's part of it. When I was at the Convergence, I rode down from the airport to the um, campground where they event was held with a young man from Upper Michigan, and he had never heard of um, permaculture activists. And some other people I encountered there had never heard of it. So to what extent that involved their being new new to the, um, the whole movement is one thing. I don't know. But I'd like to get the word out, and this podcast is certainly a step you know, in that direction, that I think we can increase subscribership quite a bit. So that's certainly one thing. Beyond that, I think I would just like to see, it, see the publication become a more useful resource for the community. We already run event ads for free. The program design is where you can go if you want to know who's teaching a PDC in your region. And, of course, we run paid ads as well. So some PDCs want to advertise their event and their venue a little bit more in-depth. They purchase ad space you know, in our publication. I'd like to see more more of this advertising, we've thought about ways to reduce the, the cost of advertising, perhaps by running some business card size ads. You know, a few magazines uh, do this, maybe for you know $25 or something, you could run a business card size ad for your design service or your, your web design service or whatever you might do, where you might want to target the permaculture community. I think we all like to spend our money with, with like-minded people or with progressive businesses. And that would be one way of doing that. So we'd like to do make some of those kind of changes and, and offer our pages as, as a service in whatever way we can figure out how to do to the permaculture community. And again, suggestions. I already received some suggestions from our writers about an Ask the Experts column. 
certainly that would be one thing we can do. But any more suggestions are really helpful. Uh, I don't really have a, a vision that, that I, I don't I don't have I don't, say I don't have a vision. I don't have a vision. This needs to be that set in stone. It's an evolving thing. I've kind of set forth where that's going to go in the next couple of years. Beyond that, it depends on our our readers and, and our supporters and where they want it to go. And that's where this call for feedback and suggestions come in to be able to make the best um, decisions moving forward that assist the readership in getting what they would like from the magazine? Our intent is to make no changes beyond this um, name change and the minor change to the cover going forward without a lot of feedback. With wanting to increase subscribership and also meeting some folks who were not familiar with Permaculture Activist and now Permaculture Design Magazine, what are some things that you'd like to share about the content, um, either previously or upcoming, that people should know about and why they should find out more and subscribe to the magazine? Sure. Well, I would say that our, the, the thrust of the, of the activist and Trump Coast Design magazine is to present kind of how-to, technical how-to articles that are, that are really content-rich, that teach people how to use edge, for example, in design. We have an article on grafting, how to, do, how to actually perform grafting on fruit trees, for example. Those types of articles are really like, we need to have more of those articles. For example, in the last issue, which was themed Building the Solar Economy, we had two wonderful articles from Christina Snyder on designing the passive house. And I think a reader could probably, if they had no other resources, could tremendously improve the energy efficiency of their home through the insulation techniques that she mentions and then some of the some of the low energy heat pumps and other strategies she mentions in those those two companion articles. Uh, that was sort of the the keystone of that that issue. Then we had an issue, we had an article in there as well on solar greenhouses and bio shelters that describe how people can grow how you can grow fruit trees at high altitude or in, in cold climates where they wouldn't otherwise uh, be be growable through careful design of bio shelters and solar greenhouses. Uh, we had two articles, actually, from two different uh, regions of the country dealing with that, that very same design. We also have articles, though, that are sort of inspirational. In that, in that issue, for example, we had an article from Utah State in Moab about some rain gardens they had planted and some of the techniques they used to divert water to conserve water uh, in that desert environment. A lot of fantastic pictures came along with that article, by the way which is an argument for color, I know, because those pictures would have presented much, much better in color than they did in black and white. Uh, and then we had an article in there on building a solar business from a, a young man who, who has done just that in Indiana. Very inspirational article and a lot of how-to information, you know, what to avoid and starting a, such a business, what to do, what not to do, along with an excellent cover photo that he provided as well for the issue. Uh, and then very nuts and bolts, permaculture, perennial grains and pseudo cereals for Eric Tosmeyer, an excerpt from his book that he provided for us. Those are the kind of things that, that you can read in, in permaculture design. The content will remain the same. Theme-wise, we're going to continue to focus on how-to, but not to the exclusion of inspirational pieces, uh, just as the activist had. And certainly the issue before that was even more permacultural. It was perennial crops. You can't get more permacultural, basically permacultural than that. So... Upcoming issue is actually called Life on the Edge, and the way the articles, I'm, I'm working on the articles right now, the way that's shaping up is to be very much dealing with cultural edges, although we do have an article on hedgerows and some information on correlated ponds, a little bit, uh, and that sort of thing. We really could use more hands-on technical information. And so again, you know, I would kind of reach out to the community and say, I know there are a lot of designers in North America who can write about how to build, you know, chinapas or crenellated ponds or some of these things that we hear about all the time. And it would be wonderful to have some very basic articles on those techniques that are written not for the advanced designer, but for somebody that's fairly new, just bought a piece of the property or wants to change their lawn into a, a foodscape or something like that. If you want to write an article for a Provost Design magazine, we would love to talk to you. This is an example of that perennial crops issue. There are a lot of in-depth articles on, for example, hybrid hickories and pecans. Bill Rutter wrote the article and dealt a lot with solid genetics information in there about hybrid swarms and so forth. Very interesting. 
we also had a very basic article on how to set up guilds. Very basic, wonderful article by Rico Zit. And uh, that's the kind of article we would like to see a lot more of. I began reading Permaculture Activist oh, probably five or six years ago, picking up an issue here, an issue there, and I've had a subscription for the last few years. And it's been a wonderful addition to my permaculture library over the years because of the themed issues and the amount of information that's included. And for many of us, as we're tied into the net these days and reading short articles and blog posts or watching videos on YouTube and then having these large books, you know, as you mentioned, like Eric Tonesmeyer and some of his work, I really like having the magazine as kind of a way to fill in between those two worlds as well as introducing me to a lot of ideas that I might not encounter elsewhere, because it's very easy in doing searches or in picking up books to kind of become really focused on one area, whereas every issue I'm given something new. And it's also nice to see many of these ideas that are just conversations that are happening in at convergences and workshops and get-togethers and the different permaculture instructors that I know and through the various guests to see that material emerging in the magazine, such as that idea of decolonizing permaculture in an upcoming issue or the recent issue about, you know, doing research and being scientifically minded in the work that we do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Lots, of new, lots of new ideas and a, very diverse, a huge diversity of perspectives among permaculture people. And I find that, I was about to call it the activist, but <laughs> I find that permaculture design is a really good forum for that diversity. The magazine is a place where all of us can come together and share a diversity of ideas and where it is then presented to the community at large. That's exactly how I, how I see it, how I want it to continue. Well, I really appreciate that you have that desire and that perspective moving forward because of how vital of a resource this is. And I look forward to being able to support the magazine in the future, both through continued conversations like this. I think that I'll have to grab Adam Brock and have him back on the air to discuss his work as a guest editor. He and I have done some interviews in the past, and I really like Adam and his perspective, so that would be a good conversation, too. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. I want to thank you for your work in pulling together these podcasts and uh, for, for offering me this chance to talk. Thank you very much. And I'm glad that you would join me for this because you've answered so many questions that I've received and really clarified a lot of the direction of where the magazine will be going. And I'm glad to know that there's this interest in not necessarily changing the content, but changing the format some in order to be able to make it more accessible. There's a, a magazine, as much as I got frustrated with it, because they continued to publish a series of articles that after you'd read the magazine for a year or two, you wound up reading a lot of the same material over and over again, but then realizing that those are the articles that are the introductions that help support the rest of the magazine by bringing new people in. As someone who's been practicing permaculture for a while, I can see the need for that in one of the Hallmark publications, such as Permaculture Design Magazine that you're now editing. With all that said, John, we've covered everything that I felt that I wanted to and quite a bit more. Before we draw this interview to a close, do you have any final thoughts for the listeners? As I mentioned, I've I really been focused the last uh, couple of months on just the logistics of sending out renewal cards and getting the issues out, dealing with the, the various databases, as well as, of course, uh, editing the last couple of issues. We have had a few problems, and one of those involved placement of mailing labels. I suppose everyone in the world knows that when you mail an item, the lowest address is the one that the package goes to. I did not know this. Therefore, we had quite a few issues. We had mailed uh, on time, which came back to us because of the placement of a certain item on the on the back cover where I said, thank you for the Kickstarter contributions and gave the address of the magazine very promptly. Very prominently, I mean, near the middle of the page. I've now realized that you cannot do this. You have to have no other address on that page except where it's going to and the return. Uh, so that, that problem has been fixed, and I would say if anybody did not get your issue uh, or didn't get it on time, I apologize. That's probably the reason why. If you haven't gotten it at all, you should definitely contact me, and we'll get a uh, replacement issue uh, out to you right away. Uh, also, for no reason, uh, nothing to do with anything Peter and I did, uh, number 96 had quite a few copies that were smudged on the inside. Apparently, there was too much ink in the printing process on those copies. 
Once we realized that, we attempted to mail only unsmudged copies and retain the smudged ones. They're not too badly smudged, but it's a little bit. So uh, I'm sure someday this will be a valuable collector's item, but for now, I thought we would hang on to them. So if you've gotten a smudged copy and you, you know, want it replaced, you know, so feel free to let me know. Great, and I will make sure that everyone has, uh, as I say, um, information to contact you in case that is the case. Thank you so much, John, for joining me and sharing so much about Permaculture Design Magazine, formerly Permaculture Activist, some of the history, how it got to where we are today with over uh, 95 issues so far in print, where it's going in the future, and what we can expect from it. It's a resource that I hope generations from now will continue to be able to read as it grows and develops over the years. And as the permaculture community changes, it changes with us. So thank you, John, for your new role as the editor and for taking on such a huge responsibility with everything else that you already do. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. And that was John Wages, the new editor and publisher of Permaculture Design Magazine, formerly Permaculture Activist. You can reach John directly by emailing editor at permaculturedesignmagazine.com. If you'd prefer to contact John with a letter, that address is Permaculture Design Magazine, P.O. Box 60669, Sunnyvale, California, 94088. As John indicated during this conversation, he expected that the website, permaculturedesignmagazine.com, would be up and running by the release of this episode, and I'm thankful to report that it is. It's beautiful, and there's plenty of content there, so please check it out. If this is your first time hearing about this publication, pick up an issue and see what a wealth of knowledge is available within those pages and why I got so effusive with John over my love for the staple permaculture magazine. A subscription is worth much, much more than the cost. As John indicated, he is also looking for people to assist in a variety of ways with the magazine moving forward. I know a number of you listening have experience with writing, publishing, advertising, graphic design, and a whole host of other skills useful for this type of media. If you're in a place to lend a hand, get in touch with John. Email him and let him know. From here, things behind the scenes are busy at the podcast. I spent this past weekend, if you get this show when it comes out, in Brooklyn at the teacher training led by Jude Hobbs and held in cooperation with The Commons and Beyond Organic Design and had a blast with the facilitators and students. For everyone who was there, may my non-linear lecture on sense of place and the role of dialogue better prepare you to set down roots and be able to meet people where they are at. All my best to each and every one of the new teacher training graduates. In my newest project, research continues to build about creating a permaculture center and community. The Facebook group for that effort, which you'll find a link to in the show notes, is looking into methods of governance. And I'm also working on arranging a site visit with a realtor. Uh, for later in the month to see whether or not this location is ideal for the project or not. Not too long from now, I'm heading to Baltimore on July 11th for a tour and to record an interview with Victoria and Eric, the folks at Charm City Farms. From August 20th through the 23rd, I'll be in Bowling Green, Kentucky at the Radical Gathering. On Friday, I'll be leading a question and answer session on permaculture with a community visioning workshop and keynote address on Saturday. I'm also delighted to say that the members of the PUSH will be at this event, with Eric Pirro being the keynote speaker on Friday night. Him and the crew will be on site that weekend doing demonstrations and workshops as well. So come on out for a great time sharing music and knowledge and community with others. Find out more at Radical, R-A-D-I-C-L-E, gathering.com. More details on upcoming events, including a roundtable recording near Harpers Ferry, West Virginia in September, and the upcoming Urban Permaculture Conference in New York in October, as we get closer to those dates. As I draw this to a close, in nearly every episode, I share how to contact me if there is any way that my experiences in Broad Network can be of any service to you. The best way to get in touch is to call me, 717-827-6266. But if that doesn't work because of schedules or time zone considerations, send me an email, show at the permaculturepodcast.com. Something that I personally just take a great deal of delight in, I'll admit it's a pleasure of mine, is to receive mail through the post, a handwritten letter or a little card saying hello. If you'd like to do that, the address is the Permaculture Podcast, P.O. Box 16, Dauphin, Pennsylvania, 
17018. Next up on July 8th is an interview with David Bollier, where we discuss the commons and the role we permaculture practitioners have in protecting that space and in forming new alliances to have an ever greater impact. Until then, until then, spend each day making the world into the place where you want to live by taking care of earth, yourself, and each other.